Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Back Lounge Podcast. My name is Tank. I'm a roadie with over 15 years of experience in the touring music industry. And on this podcast, we invite on artists, band members, musicians, other roadies, and at this point, really anybody else. And we just have long conversations about whatever we want to talk about. Now, for today's episode, episode 16, we're going to be joined by Chris Garza, who is the guitarist and founder of the Southern California deathcore band Suicide Silence. Now, this one was really kind of out of nowhere and it came together quick. I actually got a message from Finn McKenty, who a lot of you may know from YouTube and doing the punk rock MBA. He actually got a hold of me and wanted to introduce me to Chris so that we could possibly do something together. And we talked about doing this podcast and it was quick, man. Within 48 hours, we were already on a call doing this and, you know, you're about to hear all of that, but... I didn't really know what to expect with this one because I don't know Garza at all, but I was so pleasantly surprised by this man. In my experience in the music industry, it is so rare to find somebody that is so authentic and real and like unapologetically honest about what it's actually like in the music industry because a lot of artists are very wary about what they say because They know that people are going to look at them certain ways and they don't want to upset fans and stuff like that. But this was one of those wild conversations where, I mean, it was full on honesty from Garza, man. It was insane. There were some parts where I was actually surprised, like, wow, he's actually going this deep with this. So I'm really excited to bring this episode to you guys, because even if you're not familiar with Garza or his band, Suicide Silence, this is such an interesting look at like the mental state of being in a band through ups and downs and everything, man. It's wild. Now, Suicide Silence is incredibly, incredibly busy, man. They're touring nonstop. They just finished a tour recently, and they just announced that they're going to be on tour with Killswitch Engage, Lamb of God, and Baroness, which comes up in September. So if you want to check that out, give these guys a follow on social media. Their handle on pretty much everything is at Suicide Silence. And if you want to support the band as well, you can go to suicidesilence.store. Their entire official merch store is there and everything that you can get from that helps support the band. Now, after they finish that tour, then they go over to Europe to do some European and UK tour dates again. During this podcast, Chris told us that there's going to be a new single coming out soon, and we talked about their upcoming album, which is going to be called Remember You Must Die. Now, he did tell me March 10th was the date for that release. Sometimes things move around depending on the label, and I don't know if that's actually officially been announced yet, but I would say it's, you know, safe to say right now they're planning on March 10th because a band member told me, so... Be on the lookout, March of 2023, that brand new album. I'm super stoked to hear it. I'm super stoked to see these guys live again. Really quick before we start and get into this episode, just as a reminder to everybody, all of these podcast episodes are available on multiple formats. If you want to watch and actually see us interact with each other, you can check it out on YouTube. And then the audio versions are also available on Spotify and Google and Apple and pretty much everywhere else you can listen to podcasts. So however you want to do it, you want to sit down and watch, you want to listen to it at the gym or in the car, it's all available, man. But without wasting any more time, let's just jump into this conversation. This is about a two hour one, if I remember right. And uh, yeah, dude, I'm so excited for you guys to hear this one. Let's welcome to the podcast, Chris Garza. Chris, dude, welcome. (laughs) What's up, guy? Oh man, it's fucking <laughs> great. Great to have you on here, man. I appreciate the Tank time. Attacked. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more, it's kind of, kind of early for you. I mean, it's what 9am. Uh, I've been up since five, so, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's 9am right now. So yeah, most, most of the time when I do this stuff, it's like 9am is way too early for a lot of people, especially. Oh musicians. yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely not like, like the bar. It's like, you're, I mean, you're probably gonna talk to people like, Oh, can you do it at like two or 5 p.m. Yeah. I fucking hate it, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, lo- this, I love mornings. Yeah, this is, well, I've I've learned to love mornings because we have a one-year-old at home, so we kind of have oh, to wow. get up early. <laughs> like, What time? 
Um, so it, it actually today was a sleep in day and it was about seven fifteen. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Congrats, man. Yeah, thank you. It's gotten <laughs> it's gotten better though, dude. When she was like a yeah. baby baby, it was yeah. like five every day. And then nice. and then we eventually got to like now that she's a little older, it's like seven's a good time, you know. So um what time do do you guys go to bed <laughs> well my wife usually goes to bed at like you know 10 or 11 or something like that cool but once they go down that's like my time to work on stuff so i'm usually 2 nice. a.m nice so I've, I've got the you know five hours of sleep and i'm good like whatever <laughs> so good i'm look i'm uh, i'm looking forward to having a kid and you know having those uh very <laughs> short nights man Dude, it, it's, I'll tell you what, it, it, you know, I'll be real. It has been the most tiring, stressful, exhausting thing ever in my life, wow. but also the most just, I know that sounds cliche, but like the most magical, awesome thing ever. It's wild. Yeah. Like, especially the age she's at now, she's just like every day she's doing something new. She's learning. She's like starting to talk a little bit and it's just wow. crazy. Like, and the one thing I never thought about, you know, with, with, I, I assume we're probably close to the same age. So, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, no. you know, Nintendo switch and stuff like that. This thing. What, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so to see a one and a half year old that has watched me use it enough that she knows how to use it now, like, don't get me wrong. She's not opening it and putting in my passcode and stuff. But if I pull up my photos on my phone, she knows if she swipes new picture, like it's wild. <laughs> That is wild, man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Holy just the, the technology difference. And I've had friends with the young kids that are like, she'll think every screen does that. Like one of my friend's kids walks up to their TV when they don't like what's on it and they try and go like this. And oh my it. goodness. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, dude. Oh, um, holy shit. Yeah. I guess, I guess before we go any further, I should give a little shout out to uh, Finn McKenty. Finn's the one that introduced us and got this, this whole thing rolling. Um. I, I couldn't believe that when he messaged me because like I, I told you before we started, like I've been um, a fan of your guitar playing and your work for a long time. And I would almost at this point say, I'm more familiar with you, you as a player than your actual band, which is crazy. That's fucking um, cool. You know, don't get me wrong. Like I, I do listen to the band, but I was, I was a little late bloomer. Um, you know, as we go through different, like, musical fixations in our life we discover new things so it really wasn't until like the last maybe it was about like 2000 when did eddie join the band like 2013 14 2014 15 that was 14 i, I, I think yeah. that was about when i really started diving into suicide silence oh wow yeah it's just musical taste change and it's like i always yeah. knew who the band was obviously because I think it's no argument that uh, to a lot of people, you guys are kind of in that, you know, group of OG deathcore bands. Mm -hmm. And that's always been, that was a fascinating thing to me is um, I was explaining to my wife when I told her I was going to do this podcast. Um, <clears throat> I was telling her about the band and I was like, yeah, they're considered one of like the, the, the like OG pioneering uh, deathcore bands. And she's like, well, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a really good question. So I want to ask you like, you know, obviously there were some, there were some deathcore bands before you guys, like, you know, well, or early influencers, we'll say like Antagony and Despised Icon and shit like that. Of course. But how did you, starting the band, it's like, how did you develop the sound you were into? Were you into other bands that influenced that sound or were you trying to do something new? It's funny, like the, the bands that, cause no disrespect to Despised Icon, they're fucking sick as fuck, but I was not listening to them at all. Okay. Like uh, there was like the bands that I was being like inspired by and listening to, like you're, they're like, there were bands around here locally. Like there was a band called Wrench, like, you know, just like, like, like a wrench. And that was like the first band that I kind of saw and heard. Oh, like this is the sound that's kind of sick. Like they were drop A, they were sludgy. When they played the hardcore shows, which is also what we were doing. They would stand out because they had this fucking crazy singer with big earplugs and just like this fucking low growls and they st so they played a hardcore show they stuck out like dude so me and mitch were like that's the but that, 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 that was like our, our common band but uh it goes it goes even before that because the reason why i started playing guitar was corn that i mean yeah. that was it i i saw that got the life 
video and that was it that was it yeah, i was like because my uh because in, th in this garage I, I used to see my uh my dad's band practice and stuff so i, I was i always wanted to play music but i never knew what i wanted but it was when i saw heard corn i was like oh drop a tuning distortion heavy groove long hair live show and then they were here a couple months after that when i saw them they, they came here with rob zombie for the uh the rock is dead tour we're talking 98 mm -hmm. and i was like i saw monkey stage live. i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna be up there i don't i don't care how long it takes i'm gonna be up there with them i can't just sit here and just fucking watch them that's sick and, and then i saw a band called fear factory on mtv <laughs> a band called fear factory <laughs> yeah. come on and that <laughs> like, was they, that's selling they, it short dude but like you know when like when 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 you're a kid that's exactly how it is oh yeah, i mean oh yeah. the, the, the band called fear oh it's fear factory okay and then heard obsolete which i always give props to dino like okay oh, that yeah. opened my fucking mind to okay there's heavier shit then you didn't have slipknot then you get it then before i know it that was right when my parents got a computer so i'm not i'm on mp 3com i'm on all of like this like the most gatekeeper metal web websites trying to find the heaviest shit. I'm a fucking little 13 year old kid. It's like, I want, I want to be heavier than corn. And yeah. I, I found this band called uh, a couple this band called skinless and eternal suffering. And they were more, they were playing death metal that had heavy groove. So they were like, kind of, kind of toying with it. Like they'll do more. It's more like death metal, but they'll throw in groove here and there. And I was like, Oh, I want to start a band like that, but you groove all the fucking time yeah and then just combining now it's very common uh but back then no one was combining death metal and new metal nobody nobody yeah when i say nobody i mean i couldn't find a band so i just wanted to start a band that like i wanted to see in here plain and simple because and then now when I, I get older i could kind of look back and like oh like this, this, this was recently i was having a conversation uh with johnny and christ and I was like, oh, I mean, that's the reason why I play that music because it's the sound of my body. Like mm -hmm. the corn, like corn has touched something like it's deep rooted in me. It was, oh, it's that tuning. It's like, that's the sound of my body. It's that ugly tone. It's that fucking 210, 210, chug, chug, fucking tremolo picking up here. It's just, it's, it's why we're still here after 20 years later, after ups and downs of a, of a crazy career. It's because like we, we love it. And it was bands like corn. Slipknot, Fear Factory, Cannibal Corpse, uh, Skinless, Eternal Suffering, and plus bands around here that really made the sound like, okay, because Korn was like, they, they had dynamic. Yeah. It's like, I want to bring dynamic into this genre of music. Okay, so you have extreme blast beats, but you do it crazier than death metal bands, and you have these over-exaggerated bre breakdowns, but you do it crazier than the bands that do breakdowns, and you just fucking combine those, and then you have your own, your own sound, and yeah. then I kid you not, dude. Like when we put out our first demo, copycats everywhere, dude. It was nuts. It, oh, it, 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 hap that, it happened quick. It and happened that happens quick. with any new sound. I saw that. So I grew up in Chicago. And really quick before I trail into this, I think the way that you put that with music, like it's like the sound of your body. Yeah. Such a good way to put that, man. Because there mm -hmm. are some music, uh, you know, even reactions that I've done on YouTube where it's like, there's there's something that sometimes hearing new music it will literally drive me to like tears it's something that i feel yes. internally where i'm just like you connect on a level that is just it's special it's like crazy mm -hmm. and all those bands you're naming dude i mean corn got the life that was literally a life changer for me that was when i first heard that i wow. think i think i was in i was in middle school maybe and a friend's older brother got that cd and we were rocking it one day and i was like this is insane like this is new. And then even before that, uh, D manufacturer by fear factory was the first metal album that I ever like bought on my own. And nice. you got to think back then I was like, I was under 10 years old, like under 10. Wow. Yeah. Like, um, the mortal Kombat movie soundtrack had just crazy artists. They had like fear factory, KMFDM, napalm mm -hmm. death, stuff like that. A great soundtrack. Oh, it was, it was killer. And that was my gateway to, to heavier metal. Cause my dad grew up on like classic metal and stuff. Yeah. But, um, I remember hearing zero signal by fear factory and then finding out what album it was on and getting it. And then 
after demanufacturer just getting into like when obsolete came out another one that was just like you know to me dino is one of the best metal rhythm guitarists oh ever. yeah the dude is just unbelievable um yes. and all, then all of those bands that came out like too, like slipknot and then I, you're wearing a mud vein t-shirt and i, I actually mm -hmm. saw your your instagram story the other night where you're in the crowd watching that show oh yeah so, so jealous dude so jealous they were on dude you know when the band's on sometimes it was like it was so like and you're older so you, you're, you're, more, you're more present in the moment you're like i'm experiencing this right now it was just like i'm seeing a special show i, I could tell chad's on it. i could tell the band's locked in it was so fucking cool yeah, yeah. God, ryan, ryan is one of the reasons i play bass like oh wow um i remember the first time i ever heard their first album i i got a cheap bass i think it was, it was like an old squire p bass nice. and just sat in my bedroom for hours trying to berber ding and learn how to play all ryan's crazy bass yeah. parts you know how do i how do i put a dig intro yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh dude every bass player. i remember i remember when we first started playing shows in our local scene it was like every bass player when it was time for line check it's like all right can i hear some bass and you just hear burp, bum, bum, ding, and burp, <laughs> <laughs> like everybody dude and always on a bad Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, even bad. me, it was like I look back on that now, and I was like, "There's no way I was playing that close to how it was actually <laughs> supposed to go." But that's how we learn, you know. It's fun. yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's how it is, man. I always uh, I did this once, so I don't. I'm not. If you don't smoke weed, I'm not telling you to smoke weed. But uh, experience I want to share with you: if you do smoke, smoke and listen to LD50, and it's listen to the bass, and you would go on a journey. Mm -hmm. So you will go somewhere else because Brian's bass bass lines on throughout the whole record is like, what the fuck is he doing, man? Dude, and the popular songs aren't even the most impressive ones. It's like, you know, Dig and Death Blooms and stuff like that were really popular yeah. from that album. If you start getting yeah. those deep cuts, oh, God, like, dude, like so um, good. Cradle and stuff like that, it's like I yeah. can sit there for hours and just listen to that. And it's 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 wild, man, because going back to what you were saying is in my local scene, I grew up in Chicago. And whenever a new band came out, like you said, they're just just copycats. Like it's yeah. like, um, you know, I saw kind of like the rise of Rise Against and Chevelle and Fall Out Boy and all those bands. And when nice. Fall when Fall Out Boy got big, it's like there were a thousand local bands that sounded exactly like them in the scene all of a sudden. Wow. Um, and then even when Deathcore kind of started taking hold where we were, I think the the biggest. Um, band that I would lump into that category was Oceano. Oh, and cool. then all of a sudden after Oceano came out, fucking 20 other bands the next day came out. Every local show wow. we were having at the venue I worked at was all Oceano sounding deathcore bands. So interesting. Yeah, it is. It is interesting that when one new thing takes over, it's like you just get a million other things that are trying to sound just like it. And totally. Um, you know, for a lot, I like I like the evolution of the deathcore genre at this point because Same. for for a while, I I think you know in the mid two thousands when it was when it was popping off, it was crazy. And then you had like mm. I remember when like Job for a Cowboy hit the scene and everybody was like, "Holy fuck!" <laughs> like yeah, same. Oh yeah. yeah. And um, and then for a while, I I will fully admit I got kind of bored because there were a million clones like I was talking of just that brutal as heavy as you can be you know hit destroyer breakdown stuff yeah and now fast forward to like the mid to late to uh 2010s there's so much versatility going on with uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the sounds with these these heavier bands and um you know i i think right now too maybe you agree with this maybe you don't but i feel like right now deathcore is probably getting more popular than it's ever been i think yes yeah yeah oh yeah uh, it's there's like this resurgence going on a, as we speak this like second wave which i've been talking about uh pretty openly the past two months and it's been fucking crazy to see like these new uh these up and coming bands that are bringing they I don't know uh, the only word i could describe it is fresh they're all fresh mm -hmm. it's not like they're they're copycatting uh like us back uh, back in the days like there's something fresh about them they're uh, they're not making the same, well, hopefully they're not making the same mistakes that all the bands back in the day made, which is like everyone, a lot of egos involved and man managers got involved and fucking ruined the first wave of fucking death court. But the second wave, like everyone's hanging out together. They're all, there's a, uh, community of, of uh, all these bands are hanging out and they're all bringing 
each other up. Something I wish I had. I mean, back back in my day. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen all these bands come up. They're fresh as fuck. They're they're hungry. They're sick, and they're uh, they're just inspiring me. Yeah, it's cool. That's awesome. And, and I I've been very you know SS is very fortunate to be a part of this like second wave. Because, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't, like, uh, predict this. Yes, I love it. I'm always going to be here. I'm always going to be Garza and being in Suicide but I can, cannot predict this whole resurgence of, like, it's getting, it's getting big, dude. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, it's really fucking cool. And I love the fact that it's uh, breaking kind of genre boundaries as well. It's like yes. you're getting people that have never really been into heavy music that are starting to get into some of the newer bands. And, like, I actually, I, this is, I totally forgot about this until right now. I actually caught the tail end of your set uh, in Nashville when you guys toured with Ginger late last year. Oh, sick. Um, right. I I was planning on going to the show earlier, but at the time our daughter was like seven months old. And wow. after we got her down for bed, I snuck out of the house and went down to that show. And I think I came in right at like your last like three or four songs. Nice. And, um, you know, I actually had an old tour buddy of mine, I believe was working for you on that tour. Uh, I don't know what he was doing, Joe. I think he was driving you guys maybe was it joe Josiah? okay yeah oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so um and then i didn't even realize i had friends uh, that were working for ginger too like i got i got to the show and i was watching the changeover happen and then i started recognizing people and i was like oh shit <laughs> like yeah. but um i love that you're seeing that and then also with these festivals you've got bands like you know like you guys and upon a burning body just put out a new album and then you've mm -hmm. got lorna shore that's about to put out a new album and then slaughter to prevail that's blown up and all of these bands are being put on big festivals with like non-deathcore bands it's, pre yeah. it's pretty cool to see it's great yeah and and the amount of people i've seen online like that are listening to like when um uh thinking in tongues came out there were a lot of people on my channel too that were like man i usually never get into music like this but i really fucking dig this and i wow i, I love that i love when people can just get out of their comfort zone and discover something new that they like. And there were also a lot of suicide silence fans that I saw that were like, um, you know, after, after the last single, they were like, Oh, this is like going back to their roots. This sounds more like OG. And cause you get all these people that when a band does too much of the same stuff or they stick to one genre, people mm -hmm. bitch about it. And then yes. the second they try something new, those same people bitch about it. So, oh, yeah. And yeah. I know, I know that happened when the self title came out and I was just mm -hmm. like, fucking let them do something new. So with, with the newer stuff, I guess my, my question to that is, um, is that, is that something you're aware of when you write or do you guys just not give a fuck? You're like, we're going to write what we feel like writing right now. Yeah. Uh, I don't really think people understand whenever I say this, but we, uh, you know, I write from, for my for myself it has yeah. it has to be honest for for better or for worse so when people say oh let's go back to the cleansing well okay i'm doing it right now and here comes the self-titled <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's just i what whatever but i i know i know our sound but yeah. it's there's just something oh no i uh when i whenever i talk about songwriting i really do my best not to get spiritual but like <laughs> it's just I just write what, you know, I, I feel because what I feel is through the songs, you know, I mean, we didn't have, we, we, we wrote songs back in the day. We're talking 2002. We didn't have a deathcore band. And be, oh, those guys are fucking cool. You know, I wasn't wearing deathcore band t-shirts. I was wearing corn t-shirts and I was just playing what I felt was right. That's why, because you, it's, it's crazy how you could play a breakdown that sounds heavy, but it's missing something. It's missing that like you'll either forget about it in a minute or a month or a year. But when you, when you play something that feels heavy, it does, it sounds heavy because you, when it's like, it's literally what, what you're feeling like you, cause you know, I'm a guitar player. I'm not the best with my words. So I play what I turn feelings into sounds. Yeah. You know, I just, I try to, I try to kick it out. And I guess that's people could hear it and they have been connecting with, with it. But, uh, so I guess what I've been hearing with, you know, like thinking in tongues, for example, like, okay, uh, it sounds like the old SS, but like, make, make no mistake. My favorite Suza Sans record is The Cleansing. And I personally have been trying to do that record every fucking record. <laughs> uh, but when you have like, you know, but our first record came out, the genre fucking exploded. And we went from 
being on tour on Nile, getting treated like shit because we're an opening band um, to our next tour is the first Mayhem Festival with uh, Slipknot. So we go from playing like 400 people, oh, now there's 10,000 people. And yeah. then now, then now we're getting offers from Slayer and and uh, and shout out to Chad Gray from Motivan who gave us one of our first big tours as well. And you know, you've sh- shits. People think they they know how they re- they react to that when it happens, but dude, you go into a whirlwind. And I'm fascinated with bands that go through that and can still maintain the music. I failed at that. I definitely failed. Like you know, cliche, you know, drugs, fucking alcohol chicks you know and you lose the music and i've been trying to do the cleansing since the cleansing and so so when people hear thinking in tongues that's literally i mean especially more so the past two three years me personally i've been really like saying to the guys time out dude like we need to fucking fix something Mm -hmm. and you have the self-title which is people don't like that record and it's fine but you know I love Ross Robinson, the the producer, and I I was just I wanted to get back to what the band was. Yeah. As far as like emo- not sound wise, like what like get like take out all the bullshit, everything, the fucking money labels, get it all out of here. I mean, I, I'm willing to to learn more about songwriting and us. So therefore, when I when we do our next record or a record after that, it's gonna be Suicide Silence. And uh, I saw that process, and I'm like, okay. This is the road and we're, and we're going to walk it and it's not going to be pretty. And sure enough, it wasn't. And then we're just now putting out songs that people go, oh, it sounds like that. So it's just so funny. Like people could just hear something for one second. Oh, it's cool. But it, it took us years to get to that moment of like rebuilding the band, uh, just, just knowing who we are. And it took so it took yeah. years to just have that. People, oh, that's, that's a great song. It sounds like Suicide Silence. I'm like, oh, fuck. If you only knew what it took. <laughs> to sound like you as that sounds oh my goodness dude i mean do, your your honesty in that is great though man like i appreciate that a ton because i i've worked for a lot of bands and i've heard excuse after excuse and people that it's a very hard thing to to mm. like work on yourself and yes. even even if you're in a band with other members it's a very yes. very hard thing to really take a step back and work on yourself and admit, yes. Hey, something's not working right. I got to change something, whatever. Yeah. So the, your, your honesty and openness about that is just so appreciated because there's probably not a lot of other bands I think would admit that. And there's, there's a lot of bands I've seen it defend. I mean, there's bands mm-hmm. I like a ton that clearly over the years, their sound has changed. Mm-hmm. And you know, you do, you get those fans that either they fall off with that band or they yeah. find a way to enjoy it or something like that. I mean, one of, one of my biggest um, examples of that is in flames. Like the, the Swedish mellow death scene for me is like, it's one of my favorites. It's what I also grew up on. And over the years in flames became one of my favorite bands ever. And their sound started changing a little bit and stuff like that. And I had mm-hmm. friends that straight up were like, fuck this band. I can't get down with their new sound. And wow. for me, I was able to find something in it that I, I liked. And yeah. when that does happen, I'm just like, well, hey, we've already got these handful of other records that sound fucking killer and that's cool. And now we got new shit here in this era. And yeah. I mean, it's it, it's great. It's great that you're able to like, you know, take a step back and be like, let's get back to what Suicide Silence is. Mm-hmm. At the same time, there there is always room for that growth. Like, you know, yes. I don't, I don't, th- I think it's unfair for fans to hold you guys to a level where they think you need to crank out the same record every single fucking time you release a record, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's tough where you, we're, we're, we're in that position where, you know, we, we can't write the same record over and over again, but you can't do something too far off because then, you know, basically people stop buying merch and then yeah. I'm broke. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, oh, yeah, it was fucking nuts, dude. When that when that self title dropped, dude, like I literally lost everything. Like as far as like, but it was just to me, dude. It's just money. Who cares? I mean, if as long as like the music is what it needs to be, and we're on that road to make the best Suicide Silence record, regardless of what other people think our road is wrong or not, we're we're gonna do that road. And all, all up, and it's just because unfortunately we have experience with mitch and like, like really losing some something serious yeah. so everything after that literally it's just fucking easy so like 
anything after that to might seem like it, it is hard. I mean, it is hard. Like the self-titled and then uh, trying to recover from that as was hard. But compared to that, I'm lucky to be alive. Uh, yeah. As I'm down to put in whatever we need to do to make the best uh, album possible. And bands say that, but you know what? They don't fucking do it. They, they all they all walk in and say what what they're going to do, and they they say we're going to write a different record, and you listen to it, and it's the same fucking thing. Yeah. We we walk, we walk our talk. I um, mean, because it's honest. It's it's who we are. Okay, if we write. I would say this a lot, but if we do this for the subtitled, it's the record or two or three after that that are going to be really special. Because we we need to do this on our fifth record, so our eighth record sounds the way I want it to sound. Yeah. But you can't explain that to like you know a mass amount of people. They're going to hear the song. All oh, these guys are fucking done. They're fucking shot. It's over. Like you know they're 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 washed up. But they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And the older I get, the more I love Suicide Silence. I mean, I've been doing this for over 20 years. And yeah, was, I mean, no, this year is the 20th year of Suicide Silence, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, over, that's crazy, man. 20 like, years, dude. Yeah, and and it, it you make a good point because while, you know, my entire adult life, I've worked in the music industry and I've I've, I've worked on albums, I've been on tours. Um. I, I understand where you're coming from, but I love doing this podcast for, for people that have never been in the music industry because I can get it. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes and it's really, mm -hmm. it's easy for people on the internet nowadays to just shit on a band for, for whatever yeah. reason they want to. You, I mean, sure. we've got just internet trolls up the ass everywhere now. Oh yeah. But what it really boils down to is you're not just making fun of somebody's music. That's, that's their career. That's their livelihoods. That's how they feed mm -hmm. their families and pay their mortgage. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so much deeper than just like, oh, this band put out a song I don't like. Like there's yeah. so much into it, man. And, you know, one of the things too that I, I wanted to bring up that I've noticed with you guys lately, you guys just don't fucking stop, dude. It's like the fucking touring came back after the pandemic restrictions went away and you guys were like, all right, let's go and not stop. Like I was, yeah. I mean, your touring schedule and everything going on is nuts. I mean, you just finished the chaos and carnage, which was fucking, I mean, w did every show end up selling out? Yeah. I think uh, 22 out of 24 shows sold out. I mean, that's dude for, insane. for the yeah, genre insane. fucking insane. Yeah. Like amazing. And then I saw I, the tour that just got announced. I was like, Holy fuck. And then, um, you know, you've got headlining shows that you've got Kane Hill on before you mm -hmm. start that. But yeah, for anybody that wasn't aware, the next big tour going on, the Lamb of God Kill Switch. And I think the dates that you're on, you're on the majority of the tour, but it's uh Baroness is on with, yes. with you as well. Yeah. Dude, are you just fucking stoked about that or what? Oh yeah, we're all we're all fucking pumped, dude. That was, that tour was definitely a surprise. But uh, it's it's so crazy that all this stuff is happening and the record's not even out yet. People haven't even heard anything from the record, and so we're all like, you know, it, it goes like I, I do believe in uh, some conscious energy, and there's no denying if you see the band lately or you're around us, you you do feel the buzz, and that's that's definitely that took years, it took years to do, yeah, and we're and we're on it, and uh, I've. I wouldn't want to play after us right now. It's, yeah. <laughs> you, are, you are just, dude, you I've, are asking for it, dude. As, as a, as a concert goer at times, like I see those bands where I'm just like, Oh fuck. I would not want to open. That was our mentality. When I was in a band, every time mm -hmm. we played, we were like, we want to make sure that the band after us is fucking sweating about having to play. Yeah. It's great. After us, <laughs> like friendly competition, you know, of course uh, now, you know, now, you know, now I'm 36. So the competition is very uh, healthy. You yeah. know, it's very like, you know, I, I believe everyone, there's, there's room for everyone to be successful. But if you play after us, dude, it's not, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's not, dude. Not. It's awesome, man. It is funny that competition, like when you're younger, like you do, like there, I feel like when you're younger, there is more of a sense of like, fuck you yeah. guys. Fuck yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh like, yeah, like, of course. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then as you get older, you're kind of like, okay, we can all do this, but we're still going to fucking try and be the best, you know? Totally, yeah. you know, and we and we done many tours like we we just sucked, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so so I know I know that that feeling like oh shit like I know like the comparison of like doing a tour and like you know you're just not killing it, you know that didn't at that point you got to step back and like okay what's 
what do we got to fix? You know, wh- what do we got to talk about and fix it? But now, you know, you know, I've, I've had all the uncomfortable conversational conversations with every band member management and all this shit, make sure everything is on point. That's like our strength. is like a band where like, we'll fucking sit in this room. We, we hash that. We, we talk face to face. Some people don't like it, but it's undeniable what happens after those, those conversations, things yeah. get way better and you put everything out and open. Everyone gets heard. Everyone listens. And uh, when, when you get past that uncomfortable feeling of having that ugly conversation, things get better and things improve. Mm-hmm. I mean, dude, we have those conversations as, as fucking roadies. Like if I'm yeah. on a tour, if I'm on a tour and I'm our crew lead and you can, you can tell, you can tell in the energy when you're working with somebody in a, in a setting, like something's off. Yeah. Yeah. You, do. you have to get uncomfortable and you have to yes. get open and honest and, and, and talk that stuff out. And usually, like you mm-hmm. said, afterwards, it's, it's way, way better. Totally. Um, so and one thing I actually just saw this, I think a couple of days ago. So after the Lamb of God kill switch engage tour uh, ends for you guys, looks like you maybe have what, like a month at home or, or probably mm-hmm. some more festivals and stuff. And then mm-hmm. back to Europe in the UK. So, mm-hmm. I mean, and that one, dude, I was looking at the lineup for that. So the top build bands I saw are you guys and after the burial, mm-hmm. but I also saw if I remember, I can't remember everybody off the top of my head, but I know I saw like spite. And yes, right. Currents. Uh, uh, Currents Cabal is on there too. That's a newer yeah. band. I just discovered that I was like, holy shit, when I first heard that. Oh, uh, dude, lineup. it's it's killer. It's killer. So cool, and, man. And then so after that ends, we get to the end of 2022. I think I saw on one of your podcast episodes that you said that the the recording for the new record is done. Yes. Okay. And then I don't even if you know what it's gonna be, I don't think it's been announced, but the the new record's somewhere early 2023, right? Yeah, uh, it'll be. Uh, we're looking at March tenth. Uh, we're dropping the oh, first sick. song. Uh, tr- dropping the first song off that record, uh, August thirty first. So yeah. probably exactly. Uh, I'm not sure when this comes out, but yeah, I guess like a week or some by 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 the time this probably comes out. Oh shit! I've got like nothing going on right now, so this will probably come out in like three days. <laughs> oh, sick! Cool. All right, then <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, then I'll, I'll be out. I'll be out in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, sick. Yeah, this will definitely be out way before that, and then. Um, so for anybody that's listening, um, the new album is called Remember You Must Die. Yes. Is there a story behind that? Yeah, we have uh, one of my one of my good buddies uh, back here at home. Uh, he was talking to Mark and Dan, our other band members, about Memento Mori, mm-hmm. and uh, which has been used before. It's been used by like Lamb of God and stuff. A lot, a lot of bands use it, but in a Suicide Sounds fashion, we make things as simple as possible because that is the hardest thing to do. It's so hard to make things simple. And we're like, let's just use that. Let's use the actual saying. Yeah. It, I, I, I'm yeah. actually kind of glad you did do that because there was actually, there was a joke recently. Um, I think it was uh, Feuerschwanz released an album called Memento Mori and oh, wow. everybody started going, so many fucking bands are using Memento Mori lately. <laughs> Like, so the fact yeah. that you guys did the literal English translation is actually different <laughs> and unique. And I like that. Yeah, this is, this is funny. And like, that's like kind of our, our thing. It's like anything as possible. I want to be catchy as possible, heavy as possible, simple as possible, but making things simple is the hardest thing to do. So that's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, you see that momentum more, you know, everyone does that obviously, but you do the simplest version of that. It's like, oh, duh. I, yeah. lo- I love those dumb moments because it's like, oh, I, I could have fucking done that. Well, you didn't. So. Yeah. I mean, if I'm if I'm being 100 percent honest right now, I totally forgot that that's what Memento Mori meant until you just fucking said that. And I was like, it just clicked in my head. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> like, yeah. and, um, I, I, and I think Mark actually said, said the uh, translation. I was like, oh, well, that's the name of the record. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. That's sick. Is this uh, correct me if I'm wrong? This is going to be the first studio album since returning to well if you count the re-release of the cleansing but this mm-hmm. is the first new studio album since returning to century media right yes yeah yeah this is uh yeah w- one of those things that are just li- lining up but this has been a lot of things connecting behind the scenes you know when you when you have those fights with your band members and <laughs> you you fucking fix things things yeah. have been lining up and uh century media came back uh gave us a great deal that we're really lucky with and now they, you know, you get older and you, you only want to surround yourself with people that really will stick by you. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's our booking agent. You know, there was, we got dropped 
and he didn't drop us even after the step title all that shit he stuck with us uh central media at the time when they signed us we weren't here yet we weren't like thinking in tongues all oh, ss is cool again everyone's buying the shirts oh we're making all this money now when they signed us we were still like in that re rebuilding phase when no one really knows where the band is at but you know they believed in us yeah. and uh, you They're, can't <laughs> you can't buy that man no yeah. and dude they're such a great team like you know i i started this whole youtube thing during the pandemic because we couldn't tour and i've gotten to know a lot of people think that a lot of these label contacts i have now are because of my touring and it's not it's literally a lot of these labels i talk to i met because i'm doing reactions and stuff oh sick and uh the century media people that i've talked to and i, I mostly talk to the people at their german office they're just nice the, the fucking nicest people man they're awesome and it's like Anytime, anytime I see something like they signed a new band or they like even like when they re-signed you guys, it's like immediately yeah. it's on my radar. It's like they're they're one of those labels that I know I can trust whatever they're putting out. It's like I'm probably gonna like it. Totally. And they're a big reason why we signed with that label is because of uh, Mike Gitter. They're they're A A and R, which Mike Gitter used to work for Roadrunner Roadrunner like uh, back in the nineties and early two thousands. Uh that was our first ever label interest. I mean, we we came out and our first time we played East Coast, he was there, and he, we our first label interest was a major label, and it was him. Yeah. Are you talking Roadrunner? Yes. Okay. Okay. Just yeah. And he he was the first one, and then uh, I mean, fast forward fucking eighteen years later or more, like he's with Central Media, and I trust him. The band trust him, and. uh so I, I go to shows a lot around here in my area. He's at all of them. I don't got to text him, call him. I just know he's going to show up. It's and and, awesome. and and the smaller the show, you know he's going to be there. And and like and like and like the bigger the show, he tends not to go to those. He wants he's a lifer, dude, and he's still very involved with, with the scene. And that's that's a big. He's a big reason why uh, why we signed. And he believes in us. He saw something. You know, lately I've been just around people that they see something in me and us that I kind of haven't seen in a long time and so that's very been a you know inspiring once uh you like you lose something and you have a an, an entire industry and bands behind the scenes like saying you're done and it's over yeah. so to have people that still believe in you and say like dude you guys are gonna put out something some sick shit soon watch and i i, I see past all the bullshit and a lot of people don't do that you'll be very surprised how people would, would just look at you very surface level and they won't do any digging yeah, you know, or the, I see or the people that just lie to you. Like, well, there's that, is that, is that, yeah. that too. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I, I spent the last, I spent the last six years before the pandemic working for a country artist in Nashville. Wow. Um, which is wild because I did not fit in at all, dude. So you got like all these like country techs that are working for all these big country artists, and it's like then you got me in all black tattoos and a beard blasting fucking death metal while I'm like working on guitars all day. I literally, when we were doing like bigger tours, I would have like even band members like walking by me and they'd hear me like what I'm listening to. And they're just like, are you, are you okay? I was like, <laughs> are, you, yeah, are you depressed? Yeah. They're like, you're, you're always listening to such angry music. I was like, I, this fucking shit makes me happy. I don't know what you're saying. Your music makes me angry. Like, and that's, and that's the, the point yeah, that I was going to make is like, the country world was such a weird eye opener to me because, yeah. you know, I came out of the metal scene. And then when I was teching, I was working for a lot of um, like hard rock and classic rock bands and stuff. And then I did country and in country, it's just like, that's where you get the, on the surface. Like I have so many people that are just fucking lying about everything. And it's like, there's so much ass kissing and so much oh, like, yeah. Oh yeah. Like I worked for an artist that like every, he, he was such a super nice guy. And every time he came out with it, he recorded a new single. He'd show it to all of us, like the crew, the mm -hmm. everybody. And I would see all, all his like, you know, really tight people all around him are like, oh, this is, this is the best song you've ever written. And I'd be mm -hmm. like, the fuck are you talking about? And I'd be the one honest person that's like, it's okay. <laughs> like, it's, it's not, <laughs> and it's like, I, I think it, at awesome. some point in the industry, it's like, you know, people get uncomfortable when they get told that, like you said, people, people yeah. get uncomfortable when they hear, Hey, this isn't your best work or, Hey, maybe you should change something. So they get used to all the people around them, just fucking telling them it's great. And then yeah. when they put it out and it doesn't do great, they're confused. Like they're like, well, everybody <laughs> told me 
it's like when you're in a local band when you're a kid and all your fans are your friends and family and everybody just tells you you're fucking awesome. Yeah. Like, I wish there was just that one person back in the day that would have like been like, yeah, you're really not that good. <laughs> like, yeah. you, know, you know, that that kind totally. of advice is 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 hard to take, but it's invaluable. It is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's usually like the negative stuff that really like, oh, honesty. I mean, you may not appreciate it in the moment, but in the long run, you always do. Yeah, for sure, man. And it's 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 just so even for me humbling to hear you say some stuff like this about getting mm -hmm. uncomfortable and like really just taking a step back because it's like I, I don't hear that often in the music industry, man. I no. the, for the most part, a lot of the artists that I see and a lot of people are just like, we're the shit. We don't need to change everything. If you don't like it, fuck you. You know, it's 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 yeah. cool to hear, you know. A musician actually be open about being uncomfortable about stuff totally i mean it's why it's the, literally why we're still here i mean yeah. i'm very i'm very ruthless as far as being like competitive i'm very ruthless and i know mm -hmm. each band's leader and and you know i, I kind of see how they, they are around people do they communicate with a band and i'm i'm very ruthless and i look at, at a band very deeply mm -hmm. and none of them could touch us as far as our communication none of them yeah. None of them. Uh, uh, name name one death core band. Nope. <laughs> yeah. It's like I mean, it's why why we're still here. I mean, two years ago, I almost I almost left the band. I was like, dude, this is fucking this is too much, and I and I broke. But I had a a shout out to my good friend Carlos Lopez. He actually made this guitar when when he was working at Fender. Uh, I don't know. I felt like going going to his house, and I don't know. I just started venting, and he's he's one of those guys. You you only you have a a very small list of people or even though you start talking they're not going to talk they're going to actually listen to the words you say and give you some real feedback he's one he is one, one of those guys i'm just talking about shit i didn't even realize i felt he listened and he gave me pure feedback to and he basically i mean i left that his house basically okay i'm gonna i'm not gonna quit i'm not gonna take a hiatus i'm i'm gonna talk to these guys and sure enough i I text every guy. People are different when, when you're alone with them. Mm -hmm. So I had a meeting with each band member separately. I went to their hometown. I drove there, each each person, and I had a conversation, see how it felt, and it went. And a few guys were cool. A couple more than others weren't so cool. You know, I drove up to San Francisco to meet Eddie, eight hour drive up there. Now with him, got his vibe. Okay, came back. I talked to our manager because our manager is Jerry Club. And he's a, a day one guy. Like he's been with us since like demo days i pre i i mean i mitch just joined the band like he's he's been with us yeah. for a long time i hung out with him i went to a two-hour drive to his fucking house and i made made those steps and some people did didn't like it but i mean it's what had to happen then we had okay how does this feel okay the guys still want to talk and then we all got a band and jerry our manager got in the same room together here and hash it out we had the part two of that conversation and it wasn't pretty but basically, uh, I mean, for people that don't know, I mean, I own the band. I mean, I started, I started the band. So, uh, yeah. and Mitch, and Mitch came shortly after. So, uh, you know, a after a Mitch, like, it's just literally like half the soul is gone. Mm -hmm. Like, like half, I mean, literally like as cheesy as it sounds, like Sue the Science is me and Mitch, like those are two, our, our two souls, like it's. It sounds fucking cheesy, I know, but like, no, it's, I, I it's, understand it's, what it's, you're it's saying. What, it's, it's what it's what it is. And mm -hmm. then once once he's gone, obviously there's this fucking massive hole uh, that you just, that you just can't fill, and a lot of shit broke as far as like uh, money wise, business wise, and a lot of shit just wasn't lining up. Uh, a, a lot of other band members broke during the subtitled process, uh, so things. Making like a simple decision as a band was just not happening. And I was like, you know what? This band needs someone fucking driving. Someone needs to take the wheel and fucking drive this thing. I was like, well, of course no one's going to do it. It's my job. It's my job. Mm -hmm. And then you're also dealing with, with egos. Like, uh, I always shout out Jocko Willink. He has a great book. And uh, he has this section where he was like, talking about ego. And... Uh, he asked this question, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, make it as short as possible, condensed, but uh, he asked, he was talking to someone that, and they, he was like, yep, yeah, they have a massive ego, but then he, 
he asked himself, is it me? Then he realized his ego was setting off someone else's ego. And I was like, oh, it, that fucking it blew my mind, dude. Literally, it, I was like, wait. This light bulb in my mind went off. And I was like, oh, shit. The guys don't have egos. I have an ego. It's me. This is my fucking fault, dude. This is all my fault. And then, like, t- talking about, you know, that shit brought me to my knees as far as being humble. I was forced to be humble at that yeah. point. Like, okay, I, I don't know shit anymore. I don't know anything. I, I'm here to learn. Uh, and something fascinating happens when you drop your ego. Other people around you drop it as well. Yep. And it's that's like the most fascinating thing that's been going on the past few years. Like, I, I dropped it. Or at least I, I did the work, okay, and like, let's, uh, let's fix this. And then the ego drops, re- resentment leaves you, and then trust goes up. Trusting yep. the band members. That the guys trust you because they realize, oh, shit, Garza is open-minded. He's not being a piece of shit anymore. He's really listening to us. He's really being open-minded, asking questions, and really taking things over. So I basically, I took over the band. I mean, yeah. I really – and just – Basically, you just need someone just needs to drive. That, that, that's all. You, you can't you can't have five people driving a fucking car. Mm-mm. Basically, and it's, and it's any. I mean, even when I was in a band uh, back in like the mid two thousands, even though we all had our input, we definitely had just that one guy that like yeah, that's that's the leader. That's the guy that's that's making the decisions and and doing mm-hmm. stuff like that. Now, I want to backtrack and ask you kind of an honest question. Sure. When you said a couple of years ago when you were thinking about leaving the band and obviously, and I knew coming into this, like you are the sole remaining founder of this band. Was there, was there a part of you that was maybe, Oh, what's, how do I put this? Were you afraid of what suicide silence could maybe be if you left or was it even going to go on if you were going to leave? Uh, if anything other than, Today in the past, I, I wouldn't let the band go on. No. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't uh because I'm pretty obsessed with the integrity and the sound of the band, especially since we don't have, you know, Mitch. I mean, mm-hmm. everything we do has to be right, especially now. Everything is very strategic. Everything has to be in line with the sound and integrity of Suzette Sounds. It has to be that way. Yeah. Maybe in the future, maybe uh, hopefully I don't fucking die or something, then like I would okay, you guys can carry on. But now or in the past definitely not I, yeah. I would be i love this band i love the sound it's my life i'm i'm a i'm a 90s new metal kid that plays rhythm guitar that's just who i am mm-hmm. but i would be the first guy to stop suza silence if i ever feel like shit's not right or we're not honoring mitch or honoring the band name i would be the first one which i told the guys you know if this is anything that's not line, like i'm out yeah and it's just but things are things we do are for the best of the band so therefore i'm, I'm still doing it Yeah, that's awesome, man. And I'm, I'm so excited to hear this new record because like when I, when I did the reaction to thinking in tongues, it's like, even on a music video and music videos are edited and stuff though. But like, yeah, you could, you could feel the energy in that video. Like you could like, you could see it, you could see it in just, even though music videos are edited and they're different takes and stuff, you can read people's energy and you could tell when you guys were filming that video, like you were a hundred percent on board with it. So with just that, I, I'm I'm super excited to hear this new single that's going to come out, and then the new record and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like, man, it, it makes me kind of bummed that I only saw like the last few songs of your set when I when I did see you guys because now after having the, the, up to this conversation we've had so far, it's like I almost want to go. I want to see that again and be like, I want to see this energy together on stage again. And I looked at all your tour schedules, and just nothing fucking lines up. Like. Yeah. That's the hardest part about also touring is like yeah. every time there's a tour that comes through that I want to see, it's like, I can't fucking see it. Like, yeah, you guys are coming through um, on that tour. I think the closest show for me was like Kentucky, but like, yeah. or, or Atlanta and, and, but I'll make that drive. I don't care. It's like three hours, whatever. Yeah. Um, Lorna Shore is going to be here in October. I'm Sick. on fucking tour. Oh, like, no. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. every single show that comes through, it's just, and don't get me wrong. Like I, I, I love touring. I'm not complaining about that. I'm going to enjoy myself yeah. a ton, but you know, being, being in a band or working for bands doesn't really allow you to see anything else other than who you're playing with. That's why festivals are so cool because it's out of the the normal and you get to see a bunch of bands you don't normally see. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, so we've kind of talked about your influences, but is there, is there anything like currently that you're hooked on right now? Are there any records you're just fucking really into or any bands that you're really into that you've seen live recently or anything? Uh, honestly, I've been pretty overwhelmed with new music because uh, I just been going to a lot of shows and mm-hmm. obviously doing it in the podcast. I'm ta- I'm talking to everybody <laughs> yeah. every every week. Like, what's been really cool is uh, going to to the local venues here, and this literally I could literally sit back and just see this whole new fan base coming up, and it, it's been like really mind blowing to see. Oh shit, there's there's something new happening, yeah. and just to sit back and uh, let's see. I'm listening to uh, Alpha Wolf. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, Left to Suffer. Uh, I've been, I just found out about, they're not deathcore or metal or anything, but uh, Show Me the Body. Show me, I've never heard of them. Dude, they are amazing. Uh, they had this viral video of a guy goes on stage to take, take, take a selfie and the banjo player pushes the person off the stage. <laughs> uh, so I was like, oh, who? It, it was, it's fucking hilarious. And so that made me check out the band and the band is phenomenal. I just, I, I, I literally just added them on Spotify just because okay, you said that. It's I'm going to listen to them later. Listen to the fucking all 10 songs of like the, just the Spotify one to 10. Cause they're, they're all so different. It's a banjo player with a, a crushed style bass and he kind of screams. It's like this crust element, but he plays banjo. It's fucking <laughs> nuts, dude. It's, <laughs> That's it's awesome. so insane. So you have bands like that that are fucking sick. And obviously, I mean. All the up and coming deathcore bands, uh, Lon- Lona Shore, Angel Maker, Signs of the Swarm, uh, of Sulfur, the whole wave coming up is just fucking sick. Yeah, dude, it's All of it, them. it, it really is. And I, I kind of ate my words because when I started doing YouTube reactions and stuff, I said I got, I got bored of deathcore. I was yeah. like, I, I got bored after a while. All these bands are doing the same fucking okay let's do some stuff and then have the heaviest breakdown possible yeah but now there are so many damn bands that are just i mean right now oh sorry my alarm was going off um right now like every time lorna shore releases something new and it 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 does go into that sense you were talking about where you like feel the music in your body yeah there's something about lorna shore that i just connect with and cool the the fucking symphonic elements and the yeah. the blackened elements they have in it it's like yes just in my wheelhouse like i absolutely love it and to see some of these deathcore bands just fucking exploding right now like people think Lorna Shore is a new band they've been around for fucking 12 years like you know yeah so to see some of these bands that have been at it for so long that are just now like a uh, good example Lorna Shore the last time they were in Nashville they played at the end, which is a hundred and forty capacity hole in the wall. So good. And now, when they're playing here um, in October, they're at the same place you were at with Ginger headlining. Like, oh, great! In a, in a year, it's fucking crazy. That's fucking crazy, man. Yeah, yeah they're, they're they're all sick, and I like I love. I think one of my favorite things about them is they kind of remind not 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 musically. But as people, they kind of remind me of us because they're all separate personalities. They're all like their own person. Yeah. You know, kind of look like I kind of look like I'm, I, our band, like a kind of bunch of like cartoon characters. We're all like our own kind of person. <laughs> and they're all they're all fucking great. And they have a work ethic that I, I love. Like they, they did that tour with us and they went home, shot videos. I'm all oh, you guys are working. I, yeah. I, I, I love to see a band that's fucking working. And I hope, man. I, I always kind of talk talk about them, but I hope they stay focused because they're at that point where uh, I don't I don't I don't even know what I what to say, but I'm I want them to be successful. I'm just worried about who is in, in their ear because it will literally ruin bands' careers, and I've seen it happen time I, and time again. Yep, and but I will say I don't think they have anything to worry about. Because as we've been talking and we just started talking more and you said about their individual, their personalities and stuff. Yeah. You, you very much remind me of Adam, their guitar player. Oh, wow. Cool. Unapologetically honest about everything. The dude is extremely driven. Like, you know, when he He goes on, when he goes on Instagram and he like talks to people, it's like he does these Q and a things where it's like the way he answers questions and shit. I'm like, no fucking barely anybody else answers this honestly in the music industry about anything. Yes. Like yeah. he doesn't give a fuck. All he cares about is the band and what they're doing. And that's, you can tell he is 100% without a doubt 
like their their band leader like you know you are for suicide silence so mm-hmm. i i don't think they have anything to worry about and they're also century you know again we've mm-hmm. talked about how good of a team they have like um you know there there are other deathcore bands too that are starting to blow up as well that you know like for example um slaughter to prevail another one oh now, yeah yeah i would yeah. i would argue the last couple things they've put out it's like they're they're starting to throw more of a new metal influence into it which i fucking love like of course yeah it's sick and and at the same time like we've said you get some of those people that are like this doesn't sound like their old stuff and i'm like sure. fuck, fuck off like whatever you know the the single they just put out in my opinion, has one of the most just ass stomping, head banging fucking riffs I've heard on something in a while. Um, and it, it's just cool to see, you know, when I was a kid, we we as metalheads, like we got shit from people. Like we yeah. got shit oh, from yeah. people for the music we listened to, how we dressed, like fucking, I can't tell you, I'm like a perfect anecdote, anecdote to that is like in high school, I was a three sport athlete, varsity athlete, and and but but I was a metalhead. I got fucking picked on by my f- fucking teammates that were wow. like the popular jock kids just because I was a fucking metalhead. Wow. And and now fast forward 20 years, it's like metal's fucking cool all of a sudden. Like yeah. everybody's into it. It's so strange. Yeah. It's it, it is really strange. And then you know, you got fucking celebrities wearing fucking like slayer and decapitated t-shirts and yeah got people discovering metallica 35 years later from watching stranger things like it's fucking yeah, it's, it's wild dude <laughs> it's, it, it's is, just... it, it, it is wild dude I, i'm all i'm a big supporter of making the scene and our community as big as possible that's mm-hmm. always been that's been that's been me since day one like i've been I saw Suicide Silence in arenas, right? I right at the gate. You mm-hmm. know, I was like, you know, how do we get out of this venue? How do we get okay now? How do we get out of our city? Okay, now how do we get out of the state? Now, okay, how do we go across the state? Okay, how do we get a, to cross to the world? How do we get signed? How do we get in the arena? Like this was very well thought out since day one. Yeah. And, and uh we again I will say this, but you get older and you realize why you do it. And you know, the bigger my band gets, the bigger the whole genre gets and a bigger other band gets the bigger we get and i just want to see other bands succeed because that means we're we're going to succeed and same yeah. same i just want to see more so deathcore because i obviously have a more like a a soft spot for it but i just want to see the whole ship rise and yeah. the bands back in the day fucking failed at that from either could have been shitty managers uh or egos and and in a band um but i hope you know I, hopefully we learn from that that mistake and hopefully everyone tries to build each other up you know we're we're, we're trying to do it but you know there's still you have some old heads of like it's, it's just behind the scenes shit like oh they won't play over this band or they won't be built like this and their logo has to be bigger or it's like it's this fucking bullshit <laughs> yeah. it's all bullshit be, yeah. b- because people don't realize that no matter where you play on a lineup people will not forget how you make them feel. Mm-hmm. And I believe no matter where we're at, we're going to be who, who we are. So the is going where, 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 where we're going. It could be an arena, could be a theater band or whatever. We're, we know who we are and we know where, where we're going. So, so we're going this way and we're trying to use our name and, and uh, I guess you could say like the status we have now to build up any band we can raise it all. And uh, that's basically what we're doing. And other bands are not fucking down. Still, they yeah. still have this this this, this old head that mentality. We were just dealing with it yesterday. Like it's just, and uh, and we we started we talk about ourselves. You know, we don't care. Oh, they want they want to be built like that. Let them. They want a co headline. Let them. It's mm-hmm. like I I stopped giving a fuck about it because in the end, people will not forget how you make them feel. And I I know who I am. And I know for sure if you play with us, no matter where you're at, either you're if you're after us, people will leave that venue not thinking about you and feeling what we just fucking played. Yeah. Done. Done. Yeah. So it's why so it's why it's all pointless. It's like it, it doesn't matter where you are in in the bill. It matters what people feel. Cause then they they will come back or they're gonna stream your shit or like and plus, and plus it's just like it stems from ego and uh just you go know, deeper, it stands from not knowing who the fuck you are. 
Yeah, it like, is like, dude. Like, like, like deep, like deep inside you. Yeah, it's absolutely that because I've been um, both in a band and as a, as a tech, I've been in situations on like those co-bill tours and it always ends up fucked up. Like one of the last co-bill tours I did with the country dude I was working with, it's like you could, you could sense the uneasiness between like the bands and the crews. And it's like, okay, this is a co-bill, but who's closing the fucking show? Like, you mm -hmm. know, there's that weird sense of that. And um, nobody cares. Yeah, no, no, nobody <laughs> fucking cares. And like, cares, dude. that's like what I probably shouldn't fucking say this, but I'm like, I'm kind of dealing with that right now on the tour that I'm about to go on. It is a co-bill tour mm -hmm. and management is still hashing out who's going to fucking close what shows. And it's like, mm -hmm. who gives a fuck? Everybody's going to go for the show. Like, mm -hmm. dude, back in the day when my band got our first like big tour, like we were on the tour pass. It was like the most exciting moment ever. Like, oh, yeah, holy shit, we're on a fucking tour poster. And oh, we're on yeah, a tour yeah, pass. yeah. Like, it's, a, it's a big deal, man. It is. When, when we got offered that deal, we were told we were going to be second of four on the lineup. We mm -hmm. get to the first show and then it, it changed. And they're like, hey, sorry, but you're going to be first out of four now. And oh no, that's, that's a big no, no. Yeah. But at the same time, what happened was we noticed that the other band that wanted to be second was making a giant fucking deal about it. Huge oh, deal. Goodness. Like we're, we just got on a record label. These motherfuckers are unsigned and we have to open oh, for them and blah, blah, blah. And we got to a point where we were like, fuck it. Who cares? We'll play first. And what we're going to do is put on a show that they're not going to fucking match. And that's yeah. exactly what we fucking did. And like I said, at the end of the day, nobody cares. They care about your show and how you made them feel while you were performing. Yes. I mean, almost every show of that tour, we sold more merch than that signed band that played after us that fought so hard to play second. It doesn't matter, you know? It doesn't. <laughs> no, it's it's funny how people are so obsessed with like getting signed. Mm -hmm. It's like, I was like, what have you done? Like we, we, we did a full us tour without even without a label mm -hmm. and we had five bands under us and they were all signed. Yeah. I mean, dude, that's <laughs> just, just like, who cares? You yeah. Know? That's what happened to my band. Like we never got signed in the U S we signed a record deal in Japan for distribution and stuff, but like yeah. we never got signed in the U S yet. We were constantly a part of touring packages as an unsigned band, no management, no Sick. booking agent. It was just us. And it's, you know, a lot of that stems from, you know, the friends that you make when you do those shows, a lot of those yeah. tours we got offered were because of, and this is kind of funny. I, I'm actually doing a video on this soon, uh, pay to play situations with mm -hmm. like local booking agents where you mm -hmm. know how that works. It's like, yeah. Hey, give me $500 and you're going to sell tickets. Um, yeah. we did a pay to play like way back in the day with like, a day to remember in like 2007, like right when their first album came out. Wow. And we just fucking hit it off with those guys. And then they were like, Hey, you want to just come open like the next two weeks of shows for us? Wow. Fucking let's go. Like, you know, that kind of shit sick. is, is, is sick and it's awesome. And it's all about those friends that you can make on the road. And eventually that's what led me to becoming a tech instead of being in a band was when I quit my band, a band that we were touring with was just like, you want to come work for us? I was like, sure. And I remember, you know, when you start off in a band and even sometimes when you're in a signed band, it's like people, people assume that if you get signed, you're just fucking loaded. Like you're oh, making no. money, you're fucking, you're set. You can buy whatever you want. You're actually more broke. Dude. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you're, you got a label that you're indebted to. If you got a yeah. shitty fucking deal or something, <laughs> My but, goodness. but when I was in my band, I, no joke, dude, I, it was just the five of us with no crew in a van and trailer. And I probably had no more than $10 in my bank account at all times. Nice. And the first gig that I ever got offered to me, it was, I think it was like, they offered to pay me $75 per show day. And I was just like, Whoa. I'm fucking rich. <laughs> like, wow. as a, like a, as like a 20 year old or 21 year old getting paid 75 bucks a day to fucking work yeah. for a band. I was so goddamn stoked. Like, Damn. Yeah, it's just it's it's all about your uh your perception of the situation you're in, you know. Totally. Yeah. Totally, man. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. It's like, oh, you should send me five bucks. I don't even know what to do with that. 
Yeah, dude, I'd come home uh, and I'd have money in my bank account after paying bills. And I'd be like, holy shit, like, what do I do right now? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. But, totally. And then, and then this will lead into what I really wanted to talk about you, we with too. Um, my first endorsement in a band, mm-hmm. um, those people that just believe in you. Like I had, yeah. I'm not going to lie at a certain point, I just started reaching out to so many people to see if I could get fucking endorsed. Sure. And at the time it was like 2006 or so. Um, Tony Franklin was the A&R rep for Fender. Oh, cool. And he was one of the only people that returned my emails. And I was just like, Hey, we're in an unsigned band. I already play a, like a Fender P, but I kind of want to get something new. And he's like, well, what's your address? I'll just send you like a catalog in the mail to look at, which I still found weird at the time because it was like 2006 and it's like the internet existed. Sure. Um, but what he would, what he did, he didn't send me a fucking catalog. He sent two bases to my house. Wow. And just said, keep them. And I was like, so Fender was the first company that wow. ever took a chance on just, you know, a bass player in an unsigned band. And then he sent one of my guitar players a guitar. So I, I always have a soft spot in my heart for, for Fender because of that. Damn. Leading into this, mm-hmm. I find it so mind blowing when I saw you with that, with that custom Fender, because you know, a lot of bands in your scene stereotypically use Ibanez, ESP, stuff like yeah. that. So I saw your video when you, when you got that guitar made and you just looked just fucking like a kid, just so excited. How, yeah. how did that come about getting a deal with Fender and getting that custom made? Well, uh, I'm born raised here. Okay. Here in Corona, California, which uh, is where Fender is. If anybody didn't know, if you don't know, uh, if I drive eight miles that direction, I'm at the Fender custom shop. Nice. And, uh, Kind of, kind of some weird stuff. Obviously, they were from Fullerton first uh, in 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 the fifties, sixties, and so on. And uh, there's this, this a lot of weird. I'm, I'm going to try to make this story as condensed as possible because there's because there's a lot here. Um, I was born on Main Street uh, in '85, and then a couple months later, that's when they moved to Corona. Um, so they they uh, so they came here in '85, and that's when they uh. Uh, so I bought it again and the, the, the whole re-management and then they had the custom shop and so on. So fast forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I did the stereotypical, like I'm playing everything that's free. I want free stuff. Uh, the band were selling records. So I want more, I want more guitars for no fucking reason. Um, all like those cliches, which I later learned that like all, all, all those reps talk shit on all, all those artists. Just so. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if you're if, if you're that guy that asks for all the shit, guess what? They're not you're not respected. Yeah. Um. And uh, I, I I went with uh, ESP. I played Ibanez because I wanted to on on the cleansing, and then we went. Then ESP gave us our first free stuff. Then Schecter gave me free stuff, and then eventually a signature. And then um, yeah, something happened like, which goes to trans- transformation of uh, suicide sounds. I'm like, this is something isn't right. And uh, I just started destroying my gear. <laughs> I just started destroying shit. I just I I either gave away all my all my guitars, or I destroyed them live, or I or I threw them out in the crowd. And then I, I just started just destroying shit. And that kind of got like a weird. Uh, my band obviously didn't like it because they saw the like that fat bill. And but basically, what I was doing, like I was just getting rid of all 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 the bullshit. And then I kind of saw what other guys were were doing that they I, cause I was that guy too. Like you're just getting all this free shit or a bunch, a bunch of guitars. Why it's bullshit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all bullshit. So uh, it's kind of like me kind of, again, just taking out all my bullshit. So I, I destroyed everything to start over. So now I'm, I'm, I'm rebuilding. And I was like, then I started playing Fender sixes because I was destroying my shit and I needed something consistent. And I found that, a Fender Strat six string was the most consistent guitar I ever played. I mean, and also, um, again, uh, like many other players, like the Fender Strat was my first guitar. My, my, I, I found corn. My dad came home with a, a, a red Fender Strat and that, you know, that's just how I got introduced. And so I anyway, so I'm buying used Fender Strats because at the time offer up was really becoming a thing. So I'm, I have all, all these all these guitars. I'm like, these are all sick guitars. You know what? 
and it kind of hit me. Whenever I played a seven string, it never fucking felt right, and I was never stoked. Ibanez custom shop. It's gonna sound like uh, I'm ungrateful, but I had played everything that you used, brand new, store bought, eBay custom shop signatures. I'd done it all. Mm -hmm. I was like, I never liked any of them. I never did, and uh, it just hit me one day. I'm a Fender guy. That's it. I'm a Fender player, and what in my weird position is. Oh wait, there's no Fender seven strings. So one day, um, there's a, a pizza joint here that I always go to called Lamp Lamp Lampos Pizza. Shout out on Main Street. I had my favorite beer there, and uh, I had a friend that had to connect. But we were drinking. Sometimes great ideas come out when when you're drinking. Sometimes. <laughs> sure enough, we're drinking, and uh, he he had to connect there. And without telling me, he uh got that number. And then gave it to me without me giving him the okay to talk to them on my behalf. But he did. And uh, yeah, it, it changed my life. And then the next day, I'm literally, I'm, I call this guy. Uh, shout out to uh, Fred Connor. And before I know it, I'm inside the Fender factory. And uh, it's my hometown. So I'm walking the line. And there's people I went to fucking elementary school with. I said, oh shit, what's up? I haven't seen you in fucking 20 years. You know, I, 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 or, or people I've been in bands with. And uh, it's great, great, crazy shit. So my, my connection with that company goes extremely deep that I, no other artist has. Really. Yeah. So it's very and personal too. Very, it's, it's very personal. And then I just made the commitment. Like, I'm going to go for this. That's it. I don't want, I'd rather have one guitar behind me that I love for the rest of my life than a fucking 30 of any brand. or any, I want the yeah. one. And I don't care how long it takes, which is me. I'm a very patient and persistent guy. That's one of my, I don't have a lot of strengths. So uh, I'm, I'm proud of those ones. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm very patient. I'm, I'm persistent. And I don't, I don't care. I'm like, I don't care how long this takes. I'm going to commit to it. And, uh, you know, the, the steps, you know, happen. I met the guys at Corona uh, were great. I got in touch with LA Fender. So that's where you got to have to make it like official. Yeah. And I, I was nervous because it's Fender. So it's, it's Fender and also, are they going to get me? Yeah. Are, are they going to get like, am I going to talk to someone that has no idea who metal is or like what? But I walked in and I met a guy named Jason Klein. And we started talking about Converge like off the bat. I was like, okay, okay. He, fu he fucking gets it. And, uh, and he plays in a band called Outset Club. He's like, he's all, all about the heavy shit. Yeah. And then I was, you know, something happens when... You ask for shit that sounds insane, but if it's real and it's honest, it just hits. And I, I was honest about him to him what I wanted. I was like, I want, I want a gym route for free, and I want, I want other strap for free, and I want to, and I want to make a Fender semi string that will eventually be his, his signature. That that's why I'm here. I'm patient. I'm not asking for free shit. I'm I'm here. I'm I'm here for the long haul. He's like, okay, cool. And I knew for sh I knew I belonged in that room. There's only a few moments in my life I ever felt that way. And it was, that was that moment. I knew that whenever I go to Fender, I belong in the room and I stick out. I knew that because I'm not, the, the, I'm not going or asking for all this free shit or shit I don't need. I'm going to ask for specifically what I want. This is what I want and why. And they're not, they're, they're not stupid. They're people. Oh, this is what he wants. This is what he needs. Okay. We're going to make this shit happen. He's not asking for fucking all this free guitars for no fucking reason. Like everybody mm -hmm. else does. Yeah. And time passes and, you know, no one, uh, the master builders, uh, it didn't want to do it. So, uh, at that point, a year and a half has passed and then, uh, I'm going to wrap the story now, but, uh, they got a new hire and he was my age. He was like, the up and coming builder there. Uh, he was the only guy that knew how to work the computer besides Ron Thorne, which is like the legendary builder there. Oh yeah. And then, uh, I got his name and then I, I have it in in the shop. So I'll, I'll text my friend, Hey, can I, can I come out of the shop and just hang out for a little bit? And he will pretty much put me in people's faces all the time. It's so when I found out the name of the builder, I text my friend, I go in there, I meet him in person, shake hands. And, uh, me and the builder Carlos Lopez became best friends. And, uh, he's, he made it happen. And he, uh, he, he built it on his computer. Uh, it was like, it was right. And then sure enough, like two and a half years later, it's actually in my hands and he did it. That's dude. That is such a fucking cool story, man. I and seriously, and, and it's 
and, and and you're right. Like there are so many people I've text for that have guitar deals where it's just like, it really is about the free stuff. It's not, it, you mm -hmm. know, when you were talking about like the Ibanez seven string, like it didn't feel right to you. I didn't yeah. think anything of that because when people ask me like online or whatever, they're like, what's the, what's the best guitar that I could get? I'm like, here's yeah. the thing. Buying a guitar is a very personal thing. Every guitar is yeah. going to have a different feel to it. It's going to have, you know, how does your, how do your hands feel on it while you're playing? So like yes. for, for somebody to ask me my opinion on what the best guitar for them is, is like, I just don't really have the answer. Yeah. So when you were leading into yeah. that, it's like, I didn't even think anything of that because it was like, well, if, if, if Fender is the guitar that feels best in your hands, that's what it is. But yeah. just that whole fucking story is so cool, especially just with the personal uh, attachment to it. And it's, it's local. I mean, there's mm. another, um, um, there's another guitarist, uh, Hans Plotz from Feuerschwanz. He used to play, I think he was playing Ibanez for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And then he start he switched to Framus because the Framus factory is like literally a couple miles from where he's from and it's the hometown and he has the connection yeah. with it. And I'm like, yeah, that's fucking magical, dude. That is. is so fucking rad. It is. And uh Fender does a great job of uh they know who they are. They're the biggest guitar company on the planet. Yeah. I mean, there there's this this Fender and uh are, are arguably like the Fender Strat is the most iconic guitar ship of all time. That mm -hmm. and like and like the Les Paul. Yeah, and it's the two highest selling guitars of all time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I kind of knew that going in. I'm like, I know what I'm asking for. It's pretty. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. Uh, but you just can't fake. You can't fake honesty, man. I knew yeah. that everyone. Everyone I met there, because I'm a very personal guy. I knew like if people actually meet me and see what I'm about, I know they're gonna be like, oh shit okay like like the fender seven string make makes sense you're not just you're you're, you're here for a fucking reason like, like this is you like the fender seven string is you yeah and you can't fake that shit man i yeah. i no other artist can make can make, make this shit happen straight up because uh i mean talking about just just the patience alone and there is a time where it was a no like it's not it's not going to happen but for some reason i just stayed focused i didn't leave and i was talking to him at a time where it was not going to happen yeah. but the it's just you stay, you keep, I don't know, you keep trying and then things kind of line up. Yeah. The, the honesty factor in stuff like this is, is huge. And I don't think, uh, I don't think a lot of artists understand that it's like, you know, like the artist that just wants free stuff. Cause let's say it, it is yeah. a fucking ego trip when you get endorsed by somebody to tell people like, yeah, all my guitars are free. I don't pay for any of this. It is. Um, it is. and, and it's cool to say that, but there are those mm -hmm. people, like you said, like, dude, I've teched for guys that have like. 10 guitars on the road in our boat and they use fucking two of them. Like mm -hmm. there's no reason to have the rest of them out there. There's, um, there's not. It's funny. Cause I, I did, you know what? I did a, a real test. Cause right before I went to Fender, I, I played Ibanez for like a year. Um, like, you know what? I'm playing one, just one seven string. That's it. And we were in the middle of like this worldwide tour and I beat the fuck out of it. Yeah. I didn't touch my backup once. It's like you only need one guitar, dude. Yeah. You only need one guitar. I've been playing this thing for fucking two years, dude. This is only only, yeah. only guitar that I need. You only you only need one. Yeah. The only time that I've ever done major guitar changes on tour was when it was like um big big tuning change. And it's tuning like, change, you know, when you're, you know, when you're um, you know, the country artist I was working for, we're opening on arena tours and we have to have our songs change over like that. Okay, yes. if you're going from E to fucking D. Just do a guitar change. You don't have the time to tune yes. on stage. Agreed. Agreed. But if you're playing in the same tuning, like uh, like that that artist bass player, one bass the whole show, never fucking switched, never did the ego trip of yeah, I'm gonna get a different, cooler looking one up here. Like just one bass the whole show. Yeah. Um, and and it, and it is funny just going back to that as like the honesty thing. It's almost like when you when you apply for a job, somebody's mm -hmm. like the interviewer is like, why do you want to work here? And, and everybody always has that bullshit. They thought they thought about it on the way there. And they're like, yeah, what am sure. I going to tell them? That's going to sound good. We're really, if you're applying for a job, most of the time, that honest answer is probably just like, yo, I need a fucking job so I can make money and I can pay my rent. Like, yeah, that's what a lot of these companies want. They just yes. want somebody to be honest and tell them like yeah. what's going on. And it's like, it's almost a similar situation to what happened with the road stuff with me recently is like, I started talking to them. And they were like, 
well, what do you want to actually do? And like, what, what are you going to do in the future? What do you want to actually do? And, you know, I know at this point doing this for a couple of years that a lot of other content creators would talk up a big thing and fucking mm-hmm. drop how many followers they have and all this stuff. Sure. Instead of emailing these people back, I literally sat here and I filmed a, like a five minute long video for them of just introducing myself, saying what I do, what I would use of their products out on tour and just was like, hey, like it's, you know, it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. But like, this is what I would do. Fucking five days later, they sent a giant box to my house with like fucking everything that I could use wow. when I go back out on tour for shit. And I'm like, that's what I always fucking tell these artists. I was like, don't these these people deal with artists all the time. Don't bullshit yeah. them. They know. Yeah. Like, like you, you said, know. the artist that has that asked for 30 free guitars that they're never going to play those A&R reps. They're probably going to give it to them because they're going to get the exposure from it, but they're going to talk shit about them too. <laughs> Like, oh yeah, I've I've got many times I've been to lunch with a, some reps and like yeah this this guy and this guy and this guy I'm like okay and I, I know I okay, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stop asking for for free shit just for the sake of asking for free shit. Yeah, one of the more wild ego guitar trips that I've ever seen, and I I don't mean this story to talk shit because I love this guy dearly, but uh, uh, Neil Giraldo, Pat Benatar's husband, her guitar player, mm-hmm. that guy. When I toured with them and I wasn't teching for him, I was doing something else, but uh, he had like 22 guitars on the road, like multiple vaults. And he used two of them every night. And after a while, I was just like, why? And his tech was just like, oh, it's when we have guests, he can bring them up on stage and be like, hey, look at all my shit. (laughs) Like, that's really it, you know? Yeah, there's there's no reason there's no logistical real reason to have that many guitars in your vault on a tour. No. Yeah. No. So if, 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 you, if, you, if you don't have a big strain change, there is literally especially coming from me that has experience with, with destroying my shit for a few years straight. You don't need. Yeah, <laughs> I, you, you just don't. It's crazy. What's your what's your preferred uh, amp setup these days? Are you still rocking tubes or are you digital? Yeah, we're I mean, we're we're old school. You know, yeah. I, have a, I have a theory about uh, amps and uh, I had nothing against Axe uh, Ax Effects or uh, Fractals, but uh, yeah, we have amps, e- EVHs, uh, the 5153s, Mark, same thing. He has the uh, Stealths and he has these, these uh, that Omega uh, Gratifier, I think it's called. Ome- Omegas are sick amps. They're, they're, they're amazing amps. But yeah, I'm liking uh, EVH tubes. We've been tubed, uh, I mean, a whole... Our, our whole career you know i mean yeah. it's tough because i i think like obviously there's a convenience with the fractal stuff and uh or kemper but i i think like people don't put in i try to make things not digital because you don't have to do anything to your to your rig and your sound is already evolving yeah it's like I, I, like these like one one tour you're you're, like you're going in with with your amp and they have a fucking analog board at at, at the front two years later you walk in that same club they have new speakers yeah. new cabling and a, di- a digital board so my sounds are really going digital without even me even being doing anything mm-hmm. and it keeps getting more and more and more it's like okay i mean if i use amp it's already gonna have a sound that i kind of don't want yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but, well let me ask you this do you guys use tracks live very very minimal sometimes okay sometimes we, we don't even use them so that doesn't that doesn't surprise me right there that you're not using digital because every band I've worked for that's using Kemper or Fractal or whatever, yeah, it, it's because they have a lot of tracks and they're running MIDI to all their boards so they don't have to do anything. Like, yeah. you know, I I'm like you, I like the old school man. Like, mm-hmm. I my most of my amp knowledge is in tube amps, and nice. when the last artist I was working for uh, said that they were going to switch, their management talked them into switching to uh, uh, Fractal for everything. I was so against it. I was like, I, I just, for some reason, I had this thought in my head that I was like, it's going to take the feel out of everything. You're not going to have like a live amp on stage. Like it's just going to be in your in-ears. And yeah, what I will say from a tech perspective, it did make my life a lot easier in the sense of, uh, it, like you said, convenience. Like yeah. you can just set it up and it's there. And, you know, especially when we were doing fly dates, it was like, you know, take it out of the flight case and it's just ready. 
But yeah. um, but yeah, I'm a big tube amp fan, man. And um, I love the EVH stuff and that's, you know, Fender, keep it in house. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, um, dude, I've, I've, I've had you here for, for quite a bit now, but there was one more thing I wanted to ask you, you cool. about, cool. um, you know, aside from the band and everything you're doing, um, you're rocking the podcast. And I saw you've got mm-hmm. new episodes every week on YouTube and shit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, how did, uh, how did that eventually come about and how, how much of that, how much of your time is that taking up? Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's, it's been a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, long story short, uh, I, I remember like, I remember the first time I heard the word podcast, it was from my other guitar player, Mark. He's always like a week ahead of me. It fucking pisses me off, dude. <laughs> with like, with like, with like mushrooms or something that I want to do. He's always like a week ahead of me. Yeah. And I remember like he, uh, he said the word podcast and I downloaded the podcast app, the Apple one and started listening to a uh, Dave Asprey. Okay. From uh, from bulletproof coffee, I'm like, I'm, I'm I've always been a guy to like I don't like doing stuff. I, I don't like just listening or consuming. I have to do that thing I'm doing. I've yeah, always been yeah. that way. I, I I I love corn. I have to be in a band. I was podcast. I had to have a podcast. And uh, that was right when Eddie joined the band. Uh, and the band was seeing we were seeing a grieve uh counselor like a like a so so the band was going to therapy essentially. Mm-hmm. To get it, to get ready for our tour, kind of get get our head straight, um, and then I guess uh, I don't know. Like the the therapist invited me to one of his his sessions because apparently there was there, there there was a fan there. So basically, I was a patient that turned into a therapist. <laughs> it was it was it was yeah. whack. It was, it was wacky shit, dude. But it was it was fun. And then I was me being an idiot. I'm talking to this kid. I'm like, wow, I like. I like, uh, cause I'm a, I'm an introvert. You know, I've always listened my whole life. I've always observed, uh, damn, I love listening to people, you know, like it's, just, it's, it's really cool. And I kind of got the gears going, you know what? And then it kind of popped in there. Like you should, have, you should have your own podcast. It'd be pretty, pretty cool. And that thought will always kind of creep back in my head every once in a while. But the band was getting, there was, I had no emotional capacity to handle anything else. I mean, our singer just fucking died. We were about to go tour the world with our, our new singer, mm-hmm. uh, just trying to get that going first. And then once the uh, pandemic happened, I was like, well, I'm not doing anything else. And then um, I said, fuck it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just g- going to go and start doing it uh, the way I, I, I want to see it done. And it's been crazy ever since. I, yeah. dope, I, I knew nothing about lighting. Uh, the microphones, uh, cameras, uh, video editing, posting on YouTube. I knew nothing about any of that. I just Same fucking <laughs> so <Same>. and <laughs> crazy, man. I just dove, yeah, just dove, dove into it, and I just committed to it like I'd done everything else in my my life. And I was uh, having a guest a week for about six months straight, and I was doing everything. Literally, I was posting the audio, the video, I was editing the audio. I was being a host, I was getting the schedules for all of the guests and it burnt me out quick. I was done after like yeah. six months. I was done. I was like, this is okay. I took a couple months off and I was right when the band, because, uh, cause we, cause we were doing it here. The, the, the podcast was in the same room that we were doing, uh, writing our, our new record. So that made me, uh, get us, uh, you know, it's funny how life will push you, uh, when you don't want to be pushed. It's like, you know, you need, it's time to step up. Mm-hmm. Like, fuck, I don't want to. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it's funny, like, your, your, uh, your spirit knows what, what you need, need to do. Again, I, I, it's cheesy, but so I, I spent money I didn't have for an office space, and I painted the walls, and I got a whole new room, and then started having guests, because I, I, I got a spot that's close to venues. Because so I was like, okay, people don't like driving to Corona. Torrance, Torrance coming back. I, I kind of really try to get a sense of like what's happening in like the industry i'm like okay and uh like many things in my life i committed to uh, this thing i i want to i'm not i'm not going anywhere if you if you're a guest you're, you're coming to the studio that's it and i've you know i've texted a few guests or uh back and forth with managers and email and i said no to big names yeah i mean it's just i'm not i'm not going anywhere i'm i'm not uh, i'm not going to compromise the art 
Mm-hmm. I'm not. I want to have the best conversation possible, which is only possible at this spot. So I got a spot. Then I got a producer, which uh, he's why I'm still doing it because I can't. I don't have the mental capacity to handle all that shit. So now I can just be a host and uh, have fun having conversations. And our, our producer Zach Zach Perez has been doing the video edits and yeah, it's just crazy how this came up. I've always wanted to do it for four years. I just wanted to be. I wanted to have a podcast for years, and then finally, th- with the pandemic, I just literally spent all that time learning about uh, the behind the scenes, really deep behind the scenes with Suza Sans while starting something new with, with with the podcast. And also, it stems from like you know me dropping my ego. You know, mm-hmm. like dude, like I just want to learn. And what and podcasting is amazing. It, it's a win win for everybody involved. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or for the host, I mean, I get to ask questions. I get to learn. The host gets to tell their story. They 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 have a platform, and and the fans get to listen to it. So they have something to watch and listen to you when they're either driving or at the gym, having a bad day. Everybody wins. Yeah, 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 dude. And it's like I'm I'm so much like you in that sense that like, you know, when when COVID started and we all got sent home from tour, I had no idea what I was going to do. Like, and yeah. there just, there was a sense of urgency that hit me because we were told probably the same as everybody else. Like after two weeks, oh, we'll, we'll be back on the road in two weeks. And then it oh, was, yeah. oh, hey, yeah. we'll be back on the road in two months. And then it was, uh, hey, we're letting everybody go and we can't pay you guys anymore. And we don't know what the fuck's going on. So there was a wow. sense of urgency that was, you know, I need to find something to do. And what am I going to do at home? And a, a friend had be like, gave me the idea of doing YouTube and stuff like that. So like you spent a lot of money on shit. I didn't have, I bought a computer and like my entire setup that I have here. And over the past couple of years, I've upgraded everything. I mean, I started with like a $20 mic that I bought on Amazon and like a shitty webcam and all that. Nice. And, uh, but it, it made me learn like I, before I started doing this, I knew nothing about the, the sound and the, the video editing and stuff like that. And then, you know, the podcast came up for me because I was already doing like 30 to 45 minute interviews. And there were a lot of people that were like, dude, you, we would, we could take double this length. So, you know, here we are doing this and it's fun. And it's, I was going to ask you a lot of your guests, are they people that you generally already know, or have you really gotten to know a lot of new people from doing this too? That's kind of been like the cool thing about it is, uh, you know, a lot of us here, insecure I'm, I'm pretty open about that but i was like damn like i really made a lot of friends throughout my whole career mm-hmm. or like i could kind of hit him up like you know i could hit up dino from fear factory like mm-hmm. I, I i could text him i was like holy shit i i could text this guy he fucking drove down here and and this was when i was in corona i was like damn and then ross same thing i was mm-hmm. like I, I, have, I have ross's number i have ross robinson's fucking phone number you know what i'm gonna use it i'm gonna text him yeah and he was in ojai he drove three hours down here to do the podcast damn three hours and i was like shit like that has been really like just i don't know it did it has made me feel special i'm like damn like, i didn't know like i had like this kind of connection with like these these people where i, I could hit them up or and then that's been evolving to hitting up some younger bands that i don't know yeah but they know me from 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 the band and like dude like we've been listening to you guys for like our whole career like you, we're a big like influence i'm like really and just there's so many like connections i had with people that i didn't even know i had yeah and, that, and that's been like 99 percent of, of my guests like yeah. i didn't know I, I had this kind of connection with with you and uh i didn't even know you listened to the band or yeah or just or just, just closer friends um like a, a guest I I asked to be on a podcast recently, but uh, 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 there's just no no time. I asked uh, Chai Gray. Yeah, 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 yeah. For and sure. I was I was just, oh, you want fuck it. I'm 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 just gonna ask him. Fuck it. And like, we was talking, and like, he was so casual about it. I'm like, oh, dude, like, oh my god, like, cause I we, we, did, we did that tour with them in 2009, and he's so fucking cool. I'm like, damn, I didn't know, like, the impact that that the band has made. Mm-hmm. I, I had no idea. I, I, I just been so in it, like in it. And the podcast has really allowed me to kind of enjoy it. Cause I had, I, I really don't enjoy being in a band really. And I've been trying to like step back and like, Oh shit, this is happening. Holy shit. That people bought this much merch. I'm not, I'm not broke anymore. Or is this, I mean, it's a lot of little shit. I'm, like, I'm trying to like step back and like enjoy it. Like, like okay, 
it's fucking cool. But the podcast has really allowed me to like, sit back and just enjoy uh, what we built our whole career. I mean, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, it's been fucking cool talking to young bands, older mm-hmm. bands. I guess you could say legends or local bands. It's just been so fucking cool. And it, I, I do feel like, like a trash can where like, my I uh, feel like this I'm just my brain is being overflowed with like information. <laughs> yeah. But but you know what, dude? Like, you know, you know, I'm in I'm in this band, so I'm headbanging and it's been scary, man. Like I I'll come home and like kind of forget some shit. I'll be a little bit slower. I'm like, it's kind of weird. But yeah. the podcast has really helped me stay focused on it. Where like if I have a guest, I'm doing research, I have to be on it. So it's really kept me yeah my uh it's really kept the juices in my brain flowing just that alone is worth it i mean yeah. that's even, awesome i would honestly do it even if i hate it still yeah it's just, it's just just the benefits of it alone are, are just un undeniable yeah it's it's interesting what podcasting has has taught me about my own individual personality too yeah like, that, yeah i i am I'm, I guess you would, my, my wife jokes that I'm like an extroverted introvert. Like I don't really like going out. I don't like going outside my comfort zone, but I'm a really yeah. fucking talkative person. Yeah. And I listened, I go back and listen to a few of the first podcast episodes Uh-oh. I did. And I'm just like, I talk too much. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's really allowed oh me to see my personality and, and, and stuff like that too, but it's That's fun. Sick. And it allows us to make these connections. Like, yeah, you know, totally. most, most of the artists, I've had on here are people that I, I don't know. Like, wow, that's it's, awesome. Or it's, it's a band that I did a reaction to. And then somebody from their team reaches out and says, Hey, would you like to have them on? Or, yeah. You know, it'd be, it'd be cool. But like you said too, there, there are situations that we, we have to turn down. Like there was um, actually a, a really fucking, you know, and, and when you do podcasts and YouTube, there is that sense in your head where you think about numbers you try not to, mm-hmm. but it, it's just, it's, it's the territory. It's like, at the end of the day, this is kind of entertainment for people to watch. So you're like, yeah, is this going to be popular? Is it going to drive views? And there's one recently that I knew would have just absolutely fucking crushed. And I'm just like, I can't do it. Like, yeah, but that's, but I feel like that's knowing that you can't do something like that is good because then you see, you see the YouTube videos and the podcast where, you can tell the person's not in it or they're, yes. yeah. you know, and it's, that's why yeah. right now, dude, you're the first person I've done a podcast with in like a month because I, like you were mentioning, I'm fucking burned out, dude. Yeah. Like the content thing is, you know, it's tough, I, dude. I, I guess, I guess in the grand scheme of things, I got nothing to complain about. There's people out there working fucking 12 hour manual labor jobs and stuff like that. But like, I think the casual YouTube viewer doesn't realize how much actually does go into this stuff because there are days where I just, I just don't want to fucking do it, dude. I'm like, I, I don't have the time. And my wife and I are in the middle of trying to sell this house and fucking move. And oh my goodness, when we were doing house showings, every time somebody came to see the house, we had to get our daughter and our dogs in the car and just fucking go drive around for like 30 minutes. And it's like, we had no schedule, no nothing. And it's like, wow. I can't do content right now. I'm just, I'm literally burned out. I can't fucking mentally handle it. Otherwise I'm just going to have a breakdown. So there's like, I loved that I was able to do this one with you because not only has this been super enjoyable, but the fucking honesty and openness that you brought to the table is something that I often don't see from a lot of people in the music industry. And it's super fucking refreshing. So thank you for that. Anytime, man. Yeah. I mean, I love, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, I got past the uh, burnout phase, you know, I mean, and this, and this is what my, what my girlfriend taught me, like, you know, I was single for like, you know, uh, fuck, like six years, seven years just to try to, I wanted to make sure the band came back with, with Eddie and like, I had to put everything I had into it. And then, uh, you know, you learn, learn the hard way, like you need help. Uh, you, you can't do things by your, yourself. And, uh, my girlfriend, for, she's, it's almost been three years now. She's really helped me see that. She's helped me out with so many things, dude. Like, and then, you know, hiring uh, a producer for the podcast is really like, okay, now I could just enjoy it more. Cause mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, I just, this happened when, when the pandemic hit. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm lucky to be in this band. I know that uh, I get to live out my, my dream, but, you know, 
we don't know when we're, we're going to tour again, which means we don't know we're going to get paid again. <laughs> like, you know, and then on, on top of that, I'm starting a podcast. Just, just so you know, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm in debt right now, thousands and thousands of dollars to, to get that thing off, off the ground. And I spent it at a time where like, I didn't even know like when I'm even going to be in a band again, yeah. but, uh, it was, it's been so worth it. Um, uh, it's, and, uh, I'm, I want to close the podcast with, uh, with something that advice I got from Ross Robinson. And it was when, it was when we, we were doing that, that record. And I said, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm with Russ Roberts. I'm going to ask him as many questions as possible but, but without him getting annoyed. And one was like, you know, obviously corn's going to come up or slip mom. I have, I have all these questions. And, and I asked, uh, maybe selfishly, I didn't even know I was doing this, but I asked him, you know, what can it take for artists to go back to that place that made that music? Like what? Like what, I, what, what, what can a band or artist do to bring it back and really make badass shit again? It's like, well, you got to give away everything, money. You, you, you have to give away everything. And without knowing that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it's just, I took all the money I had that we built a career with other songs. I took all that money that we made. You basically put it in the trash. I was gone. Yeah. Put, put, put out that record, that money fucking disappear dude like people stopped coming out to the shows people stopped buying merch and that was advice that i really applied from ross robinson because i love him i trust him and i saw where the band could go in the future i don't care what people say about me two years ago i, I don't i don't care about that shit i know where the band's going in the future and i got advice from the most pure source possible mm -hmm. it's like and you get to a point where like okay like you have your answer are, are you going to do it or not? And well, we, we did it. Uh, we did it. And uh, other bands in the genre don't have the balls to do it. And, and, if, 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 they, and they, if they do, do it. I challenge you. Do it. And I, I got this advice from Ross Robinson. I fucking applied it. I lost all, all my money. And, the, and I transferred that to the podcast. You know, I mean, okay, I'm used to being broke. I'm used to putting in everything I have. So just I'll, I'll do it again for the sake of, you know, how can... How can something be as sick as possible? Oh, that's I'm, 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 I am obsessed with that. How can something be as sick as possible? Music, podcasting, uh, content, uh, music, live show. How could it be the sickest possible? And when you when you ask yourself questions, the answers are tend to be uh, <laughs> not what not what you want. But uh, I'm not sure where I, I got this from. Where like this, I feel comfortable just kind of taking risk and just going for it, doing it. You know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, uh, I'm very lucky to kind of have that natural, I kind of just don't care. Yeah. Like, I, cause I, I mean, I just know, I just know where it's going to go. It's like, wait, if we do this, then bigger the risk, the bigger the, the reward. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's it, you know, like, I mean, dude, it's, it's it. a, it's a good quality to have because a lot of fucking people in this world are very, comfortable like well in their comfort zone they play it safe yeah. they don't want to take the risk and you know sometimes the risks don't pay off but sometimes, in a lot yeah, of true. a lot of times they will and awesome mm -hmm. shit comes out of it yeah and also a great one, one of the coolest things about having a low is you get to know who your real friends are mm -hmm. especially if you're in a music industry and you really figure out how other people view you really I remember every little thing I, I overheard a manager say about me, a label, a band, an industry. I remember all that shit right now. It's and it's literally it's pure gasoline. It's literally the, the purest form of gasoline that I could ever ask for. Because you yeah. know, it's just it, it brings people or or you get dropped from a certain company or dropped here. Well, these people won't work for you anymore. But then when you start coming back in an up and coming. Oh, so many people start coming back. When you guys are sick, it's so good to see you guys back. And like, I'm like in the back of my head, I'm not saying it, but I'm like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, thanks, yeah. man. Thanks, yeah. man. It's cool. Because people <laughs> fucking when you, when you're on a low, people just disappear. For sure. But 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 you have those handful of people dude, that stay by you, and that is priceless and invaluable. To, like to know, I I know who my friends are. I know who in the industry is honest with with me and and my band because when we were at our lowest 
they stuck by us and still talked positive about us to other people's faces. And I, just like the negative, I know who spoke highly of us during those lowest times. And now we're in, in uh, up and coming, I see them in person and there's like this, I don't know, there's like this connection I have with like, I, I saw a friend at, at, at Mudvayne, uh, old friend, and he's one of those guys where like he's, we went through a low, he talked highly of us and I saw him, it was like this, I had this new found re, like respect for him, for him mm-hmm. you know, because when you lose some and then you have people stick by you, uh, it's just, it's, it's fucking priceless, man. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and cool, it happened and it happens in so many situations. Like when I when I originally told um when I originally told the artist that I was working for that I was not coming back, like on the road. Like mm-hmm. when when my daughter was born, I decided I'm I'm gonna take some time off. Like yeah. I'm not missing this, you know. Um dude, I can't tell you how many fucking people I haven't talked to since that I used to be around daily like people in the music industry that like, um, and a lot of that is the convenience. Like when you're on tour, you're surrounded by the same people all the time, but you really realize in that situation, it's like the second I got off the road, I found out really quick who my actual real friends were Mm -hmm. and who were basically just my work acquaintances that, you know, yeah. From, from touring. So there's, there's lessons to be learned in all that stuff, man. And that's just, totally. you know, it, it seems totally. like you've, you've absolutely come out on top and made the best of a lot of these situations that were thrown at you, man. It was, it was a uh, priceless man. I um, mean, uh, maybe to someone else that might seem like the worst thing you could do, but it was the best thing that we could have happened. We would actually be in a worse spot now if we didn't take that risk. Yeah. If, we, if we, we just wrote the same record over and over again, we would have been burnt out, jaded as fuck and probably quit. But the fact yeah. that we were forced to reconnect with who we really are and write music that we're finally happy we're writing, yeah, it's because you you, you take you take risks and start over. You gotta start over sometime, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, fuck, dude. That's a. I think that's a great point to wrap this up on. Yeah. So, just as a reminder to anybody that's listening, if you're on YouTube, there's going to be a shitload of links in the description of the video where you can go keep up with Suicide Silence and Chris and stuff like that. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple or any of the other ones, um, you can go to suicidesilence.store, official online merch store, help support the band, social media, all over the place. Keep up with it. You guys have so many tour dates coming up. The new record will be coming out in March. A lot of shit going on, dude. And I cannot thank you enough for giving us some of your time today. This was awesome. Thank you for having me, dude. um, It's kind of crazy. Like, you know, you started this two years ago and now you... You're, you're, you're able to give someone a platform. You, you, you gave me a platform. That's fucking crazy, huh? Dude, it, it's wild. I love it. <laughs> wild, I, I huh? love this. I love this, dude. Well, Badass, hopefully, uh, hopefully our schedules actually line up and I can actually come see you guys in person one of these days because you know how difficult that is. But uh, yes. again, thank you so much for your time, dude. This was fantastic. I hope thank you have you, a good Tank. rest of the day and uh, maybe we'll have you back on around the time the new record drops or something. It sounds great, man. I'm in. Awesome, dude. All we'll right. have a good one. You too, man. See you, buddy. Well, like I said, man, it is very rare that you're going to get that kind of openness from somebody in the music industry, man. I mean, this whole thing from start to finish was just so interesting for me to hear. And I hope it was for you guys, too, because, I mean, we got some of Chris's like personal ups and downs with the band and some of the history of the band and what they've been going through with their business and stuff. This was just I mean, wild, like I can't thank Garza enough for just being this open about everything. And if you enjoyed this and you enjoyed Chris and you want to hear more from him, he actually has a podcast. It's called the Garza podcast. He's got new episodes all the time and he's got some big names on there. It's not just musicians. He's had producers. He recently had Ross Robinson on there. Interesting conversations all around. I would highly suggest checking out that podcast as well. And for any of you that are watching on YouTube, I'll just throw links to all of that stuff in the description of this video. Now, just as a reminder, check online because these guys are going to be on tour pretty much for the rest of 2022. And then again, their brand new album, Remember You Must Die, is going to come out early 2023. Right now, we're looking at about March or so. So I'm stoked on it, man. I'm super into it. And these conversations are always great because it's made me look at his band and him in a completely different way. Like I have 
so much respect for these guys. And I know that's going to translate into, you know, when I listen to them, I'm going to be looking at it in a completely different way. And that's so cool, man. I absolutely love doing this. So one more time as a reminder, their handle on pretty much everything on social media is at Suicide Silence. You can follow them on Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. Keep up to date with whatever they've got going on. And if you would like to support the band, you can check out suicidesilence.store for their official merchandise store. Again, if you're on YouTube, all of this information will be in the description below, but kind of just say it out loud for all of you that are listening on audio as well. But man, we're going to wrap this one up here. I do have some stuff planned for the future, for future episodes with other people. Nothing is 100% confirmed yet, so I'm not going to like say anything and get anybody excited and for something not to happen, but I'm excited to keep this going, man. In the meantime, for any of you that may just stumble across this podcast, you can also find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash tank the tech. I have reaction videos, interviews, podcasts, stuff about the music industry, all that good stuff. And then if you want to support the channel and the podcast in any way, you can check me out on patreon.com slash tank the tech. If you want to pitch in, you get a couple cool little perks. You get to see interviews and podcasts and reaction videos early and stuff like that, but it's not really necessary, man. Just know that I appreciate all of you guys for checking this out on your own time. And really that's all I need. Just keep listening, keep viewing and share it around as much as you want. So wrapping up, my name's Tank. This has been the Back Lounge Podcast. I appreciate every single one of you guys, wherever you are in the world, be safe, be kind to each other. And I'll see you very soon for another podcast episode.